Welcome to Smarter Circuits. I'm your host, Ian Klein. There are a lot of home automation devices out there today, and most of them are pretty good at what they're designed to do, but most of them have one fatal flaw, the cloud. There are four primary reasons to design your system to be cloudless, and the last one is actually the best one, but we'll get to that. The first and probably most obvious reason to build cloudless home automation is security. Have you ever had to change your password due to a breach? Have you ever read an article about a major Chinese hardware manufacturer putting backdoors into consumer devices? Consider what letting a device whose contents you know nothing about rule your day-to-day -day life entails. It could mean anything from inconvenience to damage. I'm not saying most devices aren't secured in some form, but there are a surprising number of devices with very simple holes in their security. The biggest, in my opinion, is the services they rely on and the companies that cut corners at every chance for a profit who are now responsible for securing the programmable logic controllers in your house. I want to repeat that. What all home automation enthusiasts are installing in their homes are essentially programmable logic controllers, or PLCs, which have been in the news for the last 15 years or so as being the thing foreign and domestic hackers attack the most to do the most damage to industrial and commercial machinery. You're adding the ability to remotely control the flow of electricity in your home. Think about that for a bit. If you cannot confidently say that all precautions are being taken by your third-party service provider, I think you might be making a mistake. Being the victim of a cyber attack is probably low on the risk scale, but still something to consider. The second reason for cloudless automation is something more likely to affect your system, reliability. If you're relying on a third-party service to relay messages from your input devices or run scheduled or pre-programmed scenes, you're relying on a company to essentially pay to call your house when you want the lights on or off. Eventually, they're going to find out that it's not cost effective, or at least it's not cost effective if you don't buy a new device every couple of years to warrant all the customer support and server costs. If you're not familiar with Google's track record of getting bored of their toys and throwing them away, you should look into Collab and Wave. If you're a gamer of a certain age, you're already well familiar with this issue, but seriously, we all thought City of Heroes would last forever. Another thing you've likely had happen to you is an internet outage. What then? Maybe your device accounts for this somehow. Perhaps you have a hub or you're using Home Assistant. Great, you have this covered, but not everyone does, especially if they're using something like Alexa to manage their scenes, which I don't recommend in any way, shape, or form if you can avoid it. Basically, if you can't guarantee that your devices can talk as long as there's power, and perhaps even if there's not, you can't guarantee you'll be able to turn on your lights. That's a statement, isn't it? If you have no internet, your house does not operate the same. This is suboptimal. But your devices are amazingly reliable and secure because you just know they are. How do you know they are? Well, and this isn't a guarantee either, chances are you paid through the nose for your devices. This brings me to the third reason cloudless is better. Most of the more popular devices on the market right now that seem to have adequate security and reliability are obscenely marked up if you know what they're made out of, which I do. Most smart devices are composed of some relays or triacs for turning on a circuit or controlling how much power runs through it, some line conditioning for their own sake, and power metering or temperature sensors if they're higher quality. They usually have some kind of flash memory on board with some firmware and a microcontroller of some kind, often the ESP32 platform or similar system on chip. Most also have Wi-Fi capability, of course. These things are not expensive. The testing and certification process is expensive, but not to a company that sells millions of widgets, so I don't accept that as a reason for the inflated margins on these things. I'll be doing a bunch of videos soon on building your own smart devices instead of purchasing them, and I even have suggestions for those folks who don't want to build their own devices but still want better security, reliability, and price point. You probably already know I'm going to suggest the Shelly line by Alterco Robotics, who does not sponsor me but totally should so I can get my hands on more of their toys. Just for a simple example, here's a smart thermostat I made. It's not pretty, but I don't care. If you do care, you can tack on another $15 to $20 to buy or make a case that looks presentable, and maybe another $10 to $15 for a screen if you need one. I can do it for as little as 
The Pi here is A0W, but I could do this with a Pico, and I don't even need the Wi-Fi version. I'll have a video on networking non-Wi-Fi Picos in a couple weeks. Let's say you use the 0W, though. $35 at most right now, and the relay hat only costs $10. So for $80 or less, you can build your own smart thermostat. It won't do tricks like hand over control of your HVAC to your utility company, something I'm surprisingly not against for reasons I'll talk about in another video, but there are really handy things you can do that the Nest cannot, like implement a whole house fan like this one to prevent hot air for conditioning cycles. It takes a lot of research to know how to build this correctly, but if you're clever, you can save some money and patch a security hole, a remotely accessible device that turns on a box of fire or at least some seriously hot elements that cost a lot to run. And the thermostat is just one example. I'll be doing a lot of DIY devices you can build for dirt cheap that will oftentimes outlast the expensive alternatives, even if they're short a few features you may not need or want anyway. That brings me to the fourth reason for cloudless automation, and it's one I think is the most impactful and important. Practicality. Do you need scenes? Do you need every device to be smart? Let me show you the simplest home automation device I own. This is a limit switch. You can use it to turn a circuit on and off like any other switch, but this switch is designed to open or close a circuit if something is pushed up against it. Ever wonder how your microwave knows when the door is open? This guy. It's also how machines with moving gantries know when to stop them before they crash into other parts. If you put this on your closet door jam and connect it to the light, you don't need to turn your closet light on or off by a pull or switch anymore. Bam! Automation. And this is a trick we've been doing since only a couple years after we put electric in homes. We did this before the outlet was even standardized. Only in the most luxurious homes, of course. But we did it. What are most automation devices designed to do? Operate a switch without your intervention or attention. This does exactly that and doesn't need to do anything else. In fact, I'd be hard-pressed to think of a situation where you'd need more functionality than this, unless you wanted an override so you could sit in the closet with the door closed and the light on, which, okay, sure. If you don't need a light because you're not in the room or it's bright enough, those are things you can detect with two very simple and cheap sensors. And that's how you should look at the situation. A slight adjustment in perspective. Don't ask, when do I want my lights on? Instead, ask, when don't I need my lights to be on and how do I do that? But, I hear the skeptic saying to me, what if I want routines for my house so it seems like I'm home when I'm not? First, the absence of a car pulling in and out of your driveway is more alluring to a robber than the schedule of your lights. My grandparents had timers on their lights when I was five. This is not a new strategy for either homeowner or robber. Your cameras are better for catching, and your deadbolts, rose bushes, and screaming alarms are better for deterring hoodlums. And I'll talk about alarms in another video as well. At any rate, when you think about automating your home in any way, think first about the thing you're actually trying to do. What problem does it solve, and is your solution too much? Are you leaving a hole in your safety where a manual toggle switch used to be? Are you relying on someone else's trendy revenue stream to operate your house? Are you spending more for a problem later than you could spend for a solution you'll forget is even there until you go to another house? This is all food for thought and I think reasonable argument for stepping back from the first adoption attitude of impulse buying every new automation gadget that comes available. And if you're a tinkerer like me, well, get to work. You can do better than these companies can anyway. I do hope you enjoyed the video, and of course, if you did enjoy it and haven't already done so, please do subscribe to the channel. If you want to know what's going on between episodes, you can follow Smarter Circuits on Twitter, at Circuit Smarter, or on Facebook. And if you'd like to help make more and better videos possible, consider becoming a patron on our Patreon page linked below. Thanks for listening to me ramble, and I do hope you'll join me for future videos as I continue exploring Smarter Circuits.